From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders around the globe. These are Cloud Native Insights. Hi, I'm Stu Miniman, the host of Cloud Native Insights. And when we started this uh, weekly program, we look at Cloud Native and you know, what does that mean? And of course, one, one of the most important topics in IT coming into 2020 was security. And once the global pandemic hit, security went from the top issue to, oh my gosh, it's even more important. I've said a few times on the program, uh, while most people are working from home, it did not mean that the bad actors went home. Uh, we've actually seen an increase uh, in the need for security. So really happy to be able to dig in and talk about what is cloud native security and what, what should that mean to users? And to help me dig into this important topic, happy to welcome back to the program one of our CUBE alumni, Dan Hubbard. He is the CEO of Lacework. Dan, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Stu. Happy to be here. All right, so we don't want to argue too much on the cloud native term. I agree with you and your team. It's a term that, like cloud before it, doesn't necessarily have a lot of meaning. But when we talk about modernization, we talk about customers leveraging the, the opportunity in innovation in cloud, security, of course, is super important. You know, most of us probably remember back, you go back a few years and it's like, oh, well, I adopt cloud. It's secure, right? I mean, it should just be built into my platform and I should have to think about that. Well, I, I, I don't think there's anybody out there, at least hopefully there's not anybody out there that thinks that anything in that I go to will just be inherently fully secure. So give us a little bit, if you would, you know, where you see us here in 2020, uh, so security is a, a complex landscape. Uh, what, what are you seeing? Yeah, so you know, a lot of people, um, as you said, used to talk about what's called the shared responsibility model, which was the cloud provider is responsible for a bunch of things, like the physical access to the data center, the network, uh, the hypervisor, and you know, the, the core file system and and uh, operating system, and then you're responsible for everything else that you could configure. Um, but there's something that's not talked about as much, and that's kind of the shared irresponsibility model that's happening within companies where developers are saying they're not responsible for and security saying that uh, they're moving too fast. Um, and so what we are seeing is that, you know, as people migrate to the cloud or of course are born in the cloud, this notion of Des DevSecOps or, you know, SecDevOps, whatever you want to call it, is really about the architecture and the organization. It's not just about technology and it's not just about people. And it's more about layer seven and eight and than it is about layer one to three. And so there's a bunch of trends that we're seeing in successful companies and in customers and prospects that we see in the market around how do they get to that uh, level of cooperation between the security and, and the developers and the operation teams. Yeah, Dan, Dan I, I, I first of all, fully agree with what you're saying. I know when I go to like serverless comp, uh, they, they've got everybody chanting that uh, security is everyone's responsibility. Uh, you know, I, I think back to DevOps as a trend. When I read the Phoenix project, it was, oh, hey, the security is not something that you do bolt on or look at after. It's something that you need to shift into everyone thinking about it. Uh, security is just going to be baked in along the process all the way. So. Did DevOps fail us when it comes to security? Why do we need DevSecOps? You know, why are, you know, as you say, seven and eight, uh, the, the, the you know, political and organizational uh, challenges still so much of an issue, you know, decades into this discussion? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think there's a few moving parts here and, and kind of post COVID is, is even more interesting is that companies have incredibly strategic initiatives to build applications that are core to their business. And uh, in, in post COVID, it's, they're almost existential to their business. If you think of, you know, um, markets like retail and hospitality and restaurants, you know, they have to figure out how to digitize and how to deliver their business without potentially physical, you know, access to, to locations. Um, so as that speed has happened, um, some of the safety has been left behind. And it's easy to say you have to kind of, you know, one of our mantras is to run with speed and safety, um, but it's, it's kind of hard to run with scissors, uh, you know, and be safe at the same time. So um, some of it is just speed. Um, and uh, the other is that uh, unfortunately, the security people in many ways and the security products and, and a lot of the um, security solutions that are out there, the incumbents, if you will, are trying to deliver their current solution in a cloud way. 
So they're doing sometimes what's called cloud built or you know what I call cloud washing, and they're delivering a, a system that's not applicable to the modern infrastructure and the modern way that developers are building. So then you have a clash between the teams of like, hey, I want to do this, and the other people like, no, you can't do that. Get it out of our way. This is strategic to the business. So a lot of it has just been um, you know kind of a combination of all those factors. All right, so Dan, we'll go back to cloud native security. Uh, you, you talked about sometimes uh, people are cloud washing or they're just taking what they had, uh, putting it in the cloud. Sometimes it's just, oh, hey, we've got a, a, a SaaS model on this. Other times I hear cloud native security and it just means, hey, um, I've got some hooks into containers uh, or Kubernetes. What does modern security look like? Help us understand a little bit. You, you mentioned some of the you know, legacy vendors, what they're doing. Uh, I, I see lots of new security startups, some in you know, specifically in that you know, Kubernetes space, there's already been some acquisitions there. So you know, what do you see out there? You know, what's good, what's bad in the trends that you're seeing? Yeah, so I, I think um, the one thing that we really believe is that this is such a large problem that you have to be 100% focused on it. Um, you know, if you're doing this, uh, you know, securing your infrastructure and securing your modern applications and doing other parts of the business, whether it's, you know, uh, securing the, uh, the endpoints and the laptops of the company and the firewall and authentication and all kinds of other things, you have competing interests. So focus is, is pretty key and it's, a, it's obviously a very large addressable problem. Um, what the market is telling us is a few things. The first one is that automation is critical. They may not have as many people to solve the problem, and the problem set is moving at such a scale that it's very, very hard to keep up. So a lot of people ask me, you know, what do I worry about? You know, how do I, how do I stay awake at night, um, or how, how do I uh, get to sleep? And and really, the things I worry most about, and the way where I spend most of my time on the product side, is about how fast are builders building not necessarily about the bad guys. Now the bad guys are coming and they're doing all kinds of innovative and interesting things, but usually it starts off with the, the good guys and how they're deploying and how they're building. And you know, um, the cloud providers literally are releasing APIs and new acronyms almost weekly it seems. So like new technology is being created at such a scale. So automation, the ability to adapt to that is one key um, message that we hear from the customers. The other is that it has to um, solve or uh, go across multiple categories. So although things like Kubernetes and containers are very popular today, the cloud security tackle and challenges is much more complex than that. You've got infrastructure as code, you've got serverless, you've got kind of fragmented workloads, whether some are containers, some are VMs, maybe some are, are Omnis, um, and then some are Kubernetes. So you've got a very fragmented uh, world out there and all of it needs to be secured. Um, and then the last one, and probably the most consistent theme we're hearing is that as DevOps becomes involved because they know the application and the stack much better than security, it has to fit into your modern workflow of DevOps. So that means you know, deep integrations into Jira and Slack and PagerDuty and New Relic and Datadog are a lot more important in integrating to your you know, Palo Alto firewall and your Cisco IDS system and your endpoint, you know, antivirus. So those are the real key key trends that we're seeing from the customers. Yeah, Dan, you bring up a really important point, uh, leveraging automation. Uh, I'm wondering what you're hearing from customers because there definitely is a little bit of concern, especially if you take something like security and say, okay, well, automation, is that something that I'm just going to let the system do it? Or is it, giving me to getting me to a certain point that then a human makes the final decision uh, and enacts uh, what's going to happen there. Where are we along that journey? Yeah, so I think of automation in, in two lenses. The first lens is efficacy, which is, you know, do I have to write rules and do I have to tune, train and alter the system over time? Or can it do that on my behalf? Or is there a combination of both? So the notion of people writing rules and building rules is very, very hard in this world because things are moving so, so quickly. You know, what, what is the KMS, you know, uh, threat uh, surface? The, the threat attack surface is just changing. Um, and typically what happens when you write rules is they're either too narrow and you miss stuff or they're too broad and you just get way too much uh, noise. So there's automating the efficacy of the system. That's one that's really critical. The other one that is becoming more important is in the past, it was called enforcement. I and mean, this is how do I automate a response to your efficacy? 
And in this scenario, it were very, very early days. Um, some vendors have come out and said, you know, we can do full remediation and blocking. Um, and typically what happens is the DevOps team kind of gives the Heisman to the security team and says, no, you're not doing that. You know, this is my production servers and my infrastructure that's, you know, running our business. You can't block anything without us knowing about it. So I think we're really early. I believe that uh, you know we're going to move to a world that's more about orchestration and, and automation, where there's a set of parameters where you can orchestrate certain things, or maybe an, an ops uh, assist mode. You know, for example, we have some customers that will send our alerts to Slack, then they have a Slack bot, and they say, "Okay, is it okay that Bob just opened an S3 bucket in this region? Yes or no? No." And then it runs a serverless function and closes it. So there's kind of a, a, a what we call driver assist mode versus you know full you know no uh, no one behind the steering wheel today, but I think it's going to mature over time. Yeah, Dan. Dan, one of the other big challenges customer has is that their environments are even more fragmented uh, than, than they would have in the past. So often they're leveraging multiple cloud providers, multiple SaaS providers, and that they have their hosting providers. And security is something that I need to have holistically across these environments, but not have to worry about, okay, do I have the skill set and understanding uh, between the, those environments? Uh, ho hopefully, you know, that, that, uh, that, that's something you see out there and want to understand, you know, how, how the security industry in general and maybe Lacework specifically is helping customers uh, get their arms a little bit more around that, that multi-cloud challenge, if you will. Yeah, um, so I totally agree. Things are, you know, I think we have this Silicon Valley or West Coast bias that the world is all, you know, um, great and it's this utopia, Kubernetes, modern infrastructure, everything runs up and down and it's all, you know, super easy. Uh, the reality is much different, even in the most sophisticated um, sets of infrastructure and the most sophisticated customers are very fragmented and, and diverse. Um, the other challenge that security runs into is security in the past, and a lot of traditional security mindsets are all about point in time. And they're really all about um, uh, inventory. So, you know, I know you used to be able to ask, uh, you know, a security person, how many servers do you have? Where are they? What are they doing? And they say, oh, you know, we have 10 racks with uh, 42 servers in each rack and here's our IP addresses. Um, nowadays, the answer is kind of like, I don't know, what time is it? You know, how busy is the service? It's, it's very ephemeral. So you have to have a system which can adapt with the ephemeral nature of everything. So, um, you know, in the past, it was really difficult to spin up, say, 10,000 servers in a Asia data center for four hours to do research, you know, security would probably know if that's happening. You know, they would know through a number of different ways because a big change control window would be really hard. They'd have to ship the units, they'd bake them in, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Nowadays, that's like three lines of code. So the security people have to know and get visibility into the changes and have an engine which can determine those changes and what the risk profile of those in near real time. Yeah, it, it, it's the, what we've seen is the, the monitoring uh, companies out there now talking all about observability. It's real time, it's streamings, uh, you know, if reminds me of, uh, you know, my physics, uh, you know, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. When you try to measure something, it's, it, it, you already can't because it's already changed. So what does that yeah. mean? You know, what does security look like in my, you know, real time serverless ever changing world? You know, how, how is it uh, that we are going to be able to stay secure? Yeah, so I, th I think there are some really positive trends. Um, the first one is that this is kind of a reboot. So this is kind of a restart. Um, you know, there are things we've learned in the past that we can bring forward, but it's also an opportunity to kind of clean the slate and, and think about um, how we can rebuild the infrastructure. Um, the, uh, the first kind of key one is that over time security in the traditional data center started understanding less and less about the application over time. What they did was they built this big fortress around it. Some called it defense in depth, you know, the security onion, whatever you want to call it, you know, the M&Ms. Um, but they, they were really lacking in the understanding of the application. So now security really has to understand the application because that's the core of what's important. And that allows them to be smarter about what are the changes in their environment and if those are good, bad, or indifferent. Um, the, other, the other thing that I think is interesting is that compliance was kind of a dirty word that no one really wanted to, to talk about. It was kind of this boring thing where auditors would show up once every six months, and go through a very complex checklist and say, you're okay. 
Now compliance is actually pretty very sophisticated and the ability to look at your configuration in near real time and understand if you are compliant or following best practices is is real. And we do that for our customers all the time. You know, we, we can tell them how they're doing against the compliance standard within a, you know, a minute time frame and we can tell them if they're drifting in and out of that. And the last one, and the one that I think most um, are excited about, is really the journey towards least privileges, minimizing the scope of your attack surface within your developers and their access in your infrastructure. Now, it's a we're pretty far from there. It's an easy thing to say. It's a pretty hard thing to do. But getting towards and driving towards that journey of least privilege, I think, is where most people are looking to go. All right, Dan, I, I want to go back to something that we talked about early in the conversation, that relationship uh, with the, the cloud providers themselves. So, you know, talking AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, and the like. How should customers be thinking about how they manage security, dealing with them, dealing with companies like Lacework and the ecosystem you mentioned, companies like Datadog and the New Relic? You know, how, how do they sort through and manage how they can maintain those relationships? Um, so there's the there's kind of the layer eight relationships, of course, which are um, starting, you know, in, in particular with the cloud providers. It's a lot more about bottoms up relationships and very technical understanding of product and features than it is about being on the golf course and you know eating steak dinners, and that's very different. You know, uh, security and buying IT infrastructure was very relationship driven in the past. Um, now you really, especially with SaaS and subscriptions, you're really proving out your technology every day. You know, I say kind of trust is built on consistent uh, positive results over time. So you really have to have trust within your solution and within that service and that trust is built on obviously a lot of that go-to-market business side, but but more often than not, it's now being um, built on the ability for that solution to get better over time because it's a subscription. You know, how do you deliver more features and increase value to the customer as you do more things over time? So that's that's really really important. Um, the other one is like, how do I integrate the technology together? And I believe it's more important for us to integrate our stack with the cloud provider, with the adjacent spaces like APM and metrics and monitoring, and with open source, because open source really is a core component to this. So how do we have the APIs and the integrations and the hooks and the visibility into all of those is really, really important for our customers in the market. Well, Dan, as, as I said at the beginning, security is such an important topic to everyone out there. You know, we've seen from practitioners we talked to for the last few years, uh, not only is it a top issue, it's a board level discussion for, for pretty much every company out there. So I want to give you the final word as to in today's, you know, modern era, what, what, what advice do you give to users out there to make sure that they are staying as secure as is possible? Yeah, so, you know, first and foremost, you got to, it, it's, it, it, People often say, hey, you know, when we build our business, uh, you know, it'll be a good problem to start to have to worry about customers and, and, you know, all kinds of people using the service and, you know, we'll worry about security then. And it's easy lip service to say, start it as early as possible. Um, the reality is sometimes it's hard to do that. You've got all kinds of competing interests and you're trying to build a business and an application and everything else, depending obviously the maturity of your organization. Um, I would say that this is a great time to kind of uh, crawl, walk, run. And you don't have to think about it if you're, if you're building in the cloud, you don't have to think of the end game at, at, you know, right away. You can kind of stair step into that. So you know, my suggestion to people that are, are moving into the cloud is really think about compliance and configuration best practices first and, then, and visibility, and then start thinking of the more complex things like triaging alerts and how does it fit into my workflow and how do I, um, how do I look at breaches um, down the line? Now, for the, for, for the more mature orgs that are taking you know, an application or a new application or a stack and just dropping it in, those are the ones that should really think about how do I fit um, security into this new world order and how do I make it as part of the design process? And it's not about how do I take my existing security stack and move it over? That's like taking you know, a, a, um, you know, a centralized application moving to the cloud and calling it cloud. 
you know, if you're going to build in, if you're going to build in the cloud, you have to secure it the same way that you're building it in a modern way. Um, so really think about, you know, modern, you know, new generation vendors and solutions and a combination of kind of your provider, maybe some open source and then a service, of course, like Lacework. All right. Well, Dan Hubbard, thank you so much for helping us dig into this important topic, cloud native security. Pleasure talking with you. Thank you. Have a great day. And I'm Stu Miniman, your host for Cloud Native Insights and looking forward to hearing more of your Cloud Native Insights in the future.